Royal Highness, dear guests. Uh, my name is Nils Lunde. I'm chief editor at the Danish business uh, daily uh, Børsen, and I'm honored to be here today. I will be your moderator for the first session with Peter Tupor from Arla Foods. And I am here for the second time, and I'm really impressed by this event, fantastic event organized by the students. Um, I will introduce Peter. Uh, Peter Tupor is CEO at Arla Foods. He's also a chairman now <coughs> at Pandora. And uh, Peter has a master in business administration from Odense University. He took the position as CEO of Arla Foods in 2005. And during his time as CEO, Arla Foods has shown an impressive growth. How did he do it? Uh, how does Peter Tupor work as a CEO? And what is the new strategy of uh, Arla Foods towards 2017? We are very happy, Peter, that you are here today. Please give Peter a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Does this work? It works. Great. I'll take it back again, okay? <laughs> so that I have my notes here. I always have a few notes. It's great to be with you. It's an honor, I have to say. Butterflies in my stomach, because I would like to persuade you, the brightest of you, to come and work for Arla Foods later when you're finished here. Only the brightest. And I have great hopes, actually. I understand we have 700 people in here today. 1,500 apply. Sorry for the 800. So I know that you're bright, maybe. But one thing I do know is, as I understand, that you're very quick on your fingers because all the tickets were sold in 90 seconds. And that is a starter, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, it is probably also connected with a bit of brightness. I'm going to uh, talk to you about not just Arla Foods in general, but I've been asked to talk about branding and strategic branding. And that's interesting, actually, at the moment in Arla Foods, because we are completely changing the view on how we would like to brand our products, the company, going forward into the future. A complete change of our st uh, brand strategic thinking is a big risk. We don't know whether we will succeed. We don't know whether we will fail. But we are taking a big risk as we are changing everything we do in terms of branding. That will impact the way we think innovation. It will impact our supply chain, our production setup, the technologies we will need in the future. And it will impact also the people that we will need, the talent that we need to get our hands around uh, in the future. Of course it will, because the brands drive a lot of thinking in other foods and uh, is actually more than 50% of our entire uh, business and uh, has a big impact on everything else we do. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. But before I do you that, I need to have just a small glimpse at Arla Foods, give you a small understanding of where we come from uh, and how we, in a more broadly sense, discuss and work with strategy in Arla Foods. That might be interesting for you. And it's also necessary for you to understand that in order to understand why we are changing our brand strategy going forward. All of that is, of course, uh, uh, affected by a change in our view in our industry, in the dairy industry, but also in other foods, a change in our belief in how we think the world is going to develop going forward. And we are letting that belief heavily impacting a major change process within other foods these years. It started just two years ago, and we are in the middle of it, as I said. So it's Pretty interesting. Please do question, please do challenge, because we are still learning about our strategy uh, going forward. So, a little bit about Arla Foods. One, we are owned by farmers. We are not on the stock exchange. Would have been nice occasionally, because then we can get some money a little faster. But we are owned by 13,500 farmers. And they are placed in seven different countries, in Denmark, in UK, in Benelux, in uh, Germany. And then we buy milk on a normal contract basis all over the world. But basically our farmers, that's the core of the business, and they are our owners. So they're not only supplying the valuable raw milk, they're also owning the milk. 
And in paragraph one in my contract, it says that I have to up the, the biggest cost we have in Isle of Foods, the value of raw milk. No other CEO in Denmark has that in his paragraph one. I can tell you that. Up the costs. But that's what it is, because the farmers want a, a nice payment for their milk. And then we have to figure out how to do that. And that is when Arla becomes a company just like any other company. Doing our strategies, working with people, working in markets, working with customers. Here Arla doesn't differ from any other company that I know. But it really starts with us being a cooperative owned by farmers. And that's pretty uh, unique. And as you see, we are actually capable of serving quite a few people in this world. This is our milk pool. 13 billion liters of milk. That's much more than we consume in Denmark. That's a little less than 1 billion liter of milk in all total. So it's a lot of milk that's coming from our farmers here in New Northern Europe. And we are capable of serving everybody. And we could do that easily by making milk powder and then just selling bulk products, not caring really about you know, packaging and design and advertising and innovation. And then we would not be serving our, 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 our farmers very well because without innovation we can't add value and then I cannot live up to my paragraph one really to give them a high milk price. So we need to figure out what to do with all that milk that comes in and it comes in every day, uh, 365 days uh, a week because cows, they just keep on you know, producing milk. So it's also, uh, there's also a heavy pulse in, in Isle of Foods. We can't miss a month here or say, let's pause a little bit and uh, rethink this. The milk is just coming in all the time and we need to process this every day and put it into something that's valuable. And that's where our branding strategy comes in, as you will see uh, in a second. This milk pool has also pushed Isle of Foods. Now we have had a strategy which you've said has been pretty uh, aggressive uh, over the last uh, years. Uh, that has in itself increased the milk pool, but the farmers themselves are also wanting to produce more. And you'll see more of that uh, later in my presentation. That pushes Isle of Foods to become, in the beginning, international. We're selling in 100 countries. We have subsidiaries, uh, sales offices, uh, production even, in 35 countries around the world. So it has pushed also this enormous milk pool, Isle of Foods, to become international. And now we are entering into what we think a more global Isle of Foods going forward. We're not quite there yet, but that's the aspiration we have in the current strategy. But it's all about adding value to all that milk. It's really quite a bit of milk here, I can tell you that. Isla has grown though, over the last six years, as you said. Uh, in 2008, that was in the middle of the financial crisis when the world stopped. We actually produced and laid forward a very aggressive strategy. Pretty stupid. We called it 2015. So there was a lot of years to, to work with this. Uh, and what actually happened was that we started at this growth journey and we've succeeded with it. We even succeeded with it two years before planned. The strategy was called 2015. No sexy strategy uh, phrasing here. We are talking with about farmers. They want to know where we are in the strategy and when it's finished and when it's time to discuss a new strategy. So we had a strategy 2015 formulated in, in eight. And in 13, we actually succeeded. We finished the strategy. We reached our target, 80 billion this year, uh, 75 almost uh, last year. That was actually our targets. And what did we actually do during this uh, period? We worked, and, and, and why did we want all that growth? One, we have a clear belief that we must always be able to follow our retail customers. And in 2008, even before, but definitely now, our retail customers are growing, they're growing across borders. Look at Netto Dan Supermarket, it's growing in many countries. We need to follow them. Look at Tesco, look at Walmart, look at Aldi, look at Lidl, and I could mention them all. They're all growing their business and then they're growing them across borders. We, as a major dairy supplier, need to be able to follow them across borders in a meaningful way. That meant we needed more milk, that meant we needed more dairies, it meant that we needed more people and marketing efforts to actually follow the the customers, mainly in Europe, because this picture is a European picture. We've always been on the markets outside of Europe, but this is actually mainly Isle of Foods growing inside uh, Europe. Uh, as you see it, that's the bulk of that uh, turnover through mergers and acquisitions, as uh, you see here. 
So that's one of the reasons why we thought in 2008 we needed to, to grow. But also because we know it becomes more and more difficult and more and more expensive uh, to get your hands around and invest in the right technology. It's pretty advanced technology that we have in the dairy industry or in the food industry, I would say, as such. Let me give you an example. In, 2000, in the year 2000, the dairy in Denmark in Slagelse servicing Copenhagen, 250 million liters uh, a year, the dairy facility, actually one of the big dairies in Europe. Great. Last year, we opened a dairy outside London, more than one billion liters of milk, carbon neutral, completely different technology, cost us two billion Danish kroner. Whoa. Uh, just in, it requires some size in order to be able to be efficient, carbon neutral, having an offering to the customers and the consumers that, uh, that they want, and that keeps on changing. So size matters. We needed also the financial strength to follow uh, this development. And that has created a very strong European platform uh, for Alla at, uh, now. But now things are changing. And that's why I will tell you a little bit about how we are looking forward. And let me do so by, sorry again, looking backward. In 2013, we finished and completed our, our 2015 plan. And how did we work with that? I had personally 25 must win battles to do this in this market, to do this with this product area, category, etc. And that was drilled down, as I guess many companies do, into hundreds, if not thousands, of different projects that all supported my 25 or the executive management's 25 must win battles. Things we had to do in order to, to succeed. Size, but size in a meaningful way, something that produced value, market positions, customer positions, etc finished in 2013 and now we are with yet another strategy with an unsexy word as i said uh, embarking on the 2017 strategy still some years to run on this and we're on track i guess i hope and that is much more of a global ala foods approach what we need to do is to produce some thinking and we are already quite a, a bit of uh, down that line of how to get more of the milk that our farmers produce in uh, Northern Europe, the 13 billion liters of milk, to get more of that out to emerging markets, the growing markets, who actually are capable, more than anybody we should think, of paying a better price than what you, shame on you, pay when you go into Netto and Fertex and Superbosen in Denmark. They are actually paying more for the milk and the cheese and the butter in the emerging markets when we sell it as branded products. And that's, of course, a big driver for us uh, to understand how can we, uh, how can our strategy be developed so other food tr truly becomes a global dairy? I guess we are, if we measure ourselves up against uh, competitors uh, uh, of, of the same sort, but but we our definition of globality is uh, or and globalization uh, stretches further, and there is some journey here uh, ahead of us, probably beyond 2017. This is our strategy. The way we work, as I said, 25 must win battles. And this is much more this time about creating innovation and value on our market positions in Europe, which previously was much more an aggressive uh, strategy. And now we put our focus, our growth focus, I would almost say the entire fo uh, growth focus outside of Europe on the emerging markets and that exciting world that should deliver the growth for us uh, going forward. It's not gonna be 12 billion liters of milk that we will put out there, but we have to put a lot of milk out there. And we don't have all the answers today as to how to do that, but we know that we not need to find these answers. We know that we need to develop new products and new market positions outside of Europe, outside of US where we are also strong, uh, in order to be part of this uh, very exciting uh, future. And that will, as I said, change our brand strategy. It is changing our brand strategy. It will change and is changing our innovation strategy. And it will also change the technology that we will buy and acquire uh, going forward. There are two reasons why we are so obsessed with growth and growth outside of Europe. One is that our farmers, due to legis uh, legislation in Europe, are set free. They're allowed to produce whatever milk they have been quotized uh, so far. They will next year, April, 1st of April, be allowed to produce whatever they want, if they can. Worry, they are coming, I can tell you. They're already preparing now. We're seeing five, six percent growth in our milk pool now. We'll see that next year. And that's gonna continue for at least for the next five, six years. 
And that's uh, based on 13 billion liters of milk. So when we meet, hopefully, three, four years from now, they would have grown their milk pool, our milk pool, with 20%. What to do with 33 billion liters of milk? That's three times the, times the Danish market. We have to find three Danish markets somewhere in this world. Now, they're not right there available, so we need to break it up into markets and categories, and what do I know? That's our, our challenge. So we will still be growing, but we'll be growing predominantly outside of Europe, and we need to find the right uh, brand positions in order to create, and, and market positions in order to create value on all of that milk coming in. So that's an inside-out uh, force that drives our thinking. And some of you would say, wrong. Listen, you have to listen to the market. It must be the market that drives you. I'm sorry, we are cooperative. That's how it is. Our owners want to produce more milk. So there's an inside out driver in Arla Foods, and there has always been there. And then we need to translate that into how this becomes a market driven issue. And luckily enough, there is plenty of reasons why to grow outside of Europe, and that is our market, market driven logic. This, as you can see, uh, I guess some of you have studied that already. This is share of world GDP, emerging markets up against uh, the advanced economies or, or developed countries. They are bigger than us already. There's a lot of people, so they are probably on an individual uh, level poorer than us. But there is a f fast changing, and it's happening now, uh, change of this world. Just on a, on a very high level financial, uh, as a high level financial analysis. And I'll now break that into what that impacts and can we see an impact on the dairy market. And there is, there is now in many, many decades or several decades actually, a 100% correlation between the consumption of dairy foods, of dairy products <laughs> and other food stuff as well, but dairy and the growth in GDP in any given market. We, so we know there, there, there's, no, there's no big issue around China, you know, they're growing their GDP. And guess what? They are at the same slope growing 7 8% their dairy consumption. And they've been doing that for many years. That's why, we, of course, we are very interested to keep up the momentum and hope that China will keep up the momentum because that alone will cr produce a heavy demand of dairy products. But this will shape and is shaping uh, the way we think uh, going forward. There will be, over the next couple of decades, this world will need to feed not 6 billion, but 9 billion inhabitants. The middle income will grow from 2.5 to 5 billion. And that middle income are prime targets or consumers of dairy products, as I just mentioned to you. So we know there's a lot of demand out there. The horrible, or no, not the horrible, but the challenging thing is actually that this world doesn't know how to feed 9 billion people today. I'm sure that we will as the de world develops and as we as a company develop and the dairy sector develops, we will find ways in order to, to make, you know, to feed the world somehow. But if you ask people today, how can we feed in a meaningful way, in a sustainable way also, 9 billion inhabitants of this world, nobody has the answer. That is challenging, but it's also a great opportunity to a company like us to participate in how can we help feed the world and at the same time create value to our farmer owners on raw milk. And that's why this is a really a core of our strategy going forward. How to be far part of feeding the world, knowing that we don't have the answers now. We don't even have enough cows in this world combined, not only in other foods to feed that dairy consumption going forward. How do you do that? Well, you breed some more cows, yes, but if you do it at the pace that the cow today normally would like it to be, you will not hit the target. You'll, uh, you will not have enough uh, milk out there. So how do we do this? That requires a lot of thinking and doing. Look at this one. Urbanization, driving wealth. I'm in China four or five times a year, and I'm amazed every time how, you know, uh, Beijing, I just came back um, last Monday, you know, when you fly over Beijing, there's a pops up, oh, this was not there last time, uh, and, and, and it just keeps on uh, developing this urbanization uh, process. But it also drives wealth, 
And in terms of dairy, you know, suddenly you, uh, the whole logistical uh, situation around dairy, refrigerators in people's home becomes uh, something that is uh, possible. And this will, this will, this picture will change fundamentally, I think, and I hope for you that you have understood, the way we think markets and consumers and customers going forward. Because it's a completely different world. Everybody at the moment in the dairy industry, not only Ala Foods, are deploying resources into China, into Southeast Asia, into uh, Middle East, we've been there for many years, uh, even into Africa now. Uh, you can't travel through Nigeria airport without uh, saying hello to uh, at least one or two competitors from the dairy industry. So we are all deploying a lot of thinking and a lot of resources, manpower, into this exciting, very new world. We just opened, with the help of the royal family, uh, six months ago, uh, an innovation center in Beijing. And we are opening uh, next year a center, uh, a sales and commercial center in Kuala Lumpur. So we are constantly deploying more and more resources into this area. Look at this one. Because everybody is talking China. But China and India and United States and Europe can be inside the geography of Africa. And Africa will, right about the time when your careers peak, I guess, be, have a population which is bigger, and there will be quite a few, uh, middle, uh, many middle income people at that time. So when your career peaks, Africa will be bigger than China and Asia and, and, uh, and uh, China and India. Are you studying that somehow now? We are. I'll tell you a little bit about that and preparing ourselves uh, for this future. I think that 10 years from now we will talk about Africa with the same respect and it will be talking town like, like China has become uh, today. In Ala Foods, we are right now working on this. Although it's a bit premature and the market is not that big, it's growing rapidly, I can tell you that. We are setting up a new dairy facility as we speak. It has to open next, uh, ne next spring in Nigeria, of all places. We just found a CEO and a sales director, and we need a marketing director, so it's open for... Uh, <laughs> it's difficult at the moment in that part of, uh, of Africa, I can tell you that. We opened last year in Ivory Coast, uh, a small dairy facility. That's also pretty dip uh, difficult. We are bidding now for a, a, a company to buy a company in, uh, in Egypt, together with all our competitors, so it's, it's, it's going to be a nice price, I, I, I can tell you that. And we are planning at the end of 2000 and open to open, of all places in the world, a small dairy facility in Djibouti. Here we need some very young uh, and adventurous people. <laughs> but that is us setting uh, some platform going forward. Why? Because the emerging markets will account for 90% of all growth opportunities in this world. That is why we are working with Asia, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, etc., South America as well, because that's where the growth comes from. And isn't that nice? But the real scary thing is that this rapid growth is happening so fast at the moment in our industry that in, during the next five years, I know that yet again, within our industry, will be created winners and losers. And we refuse to be losers. But we don't know. It can happen. Because this is, you know, unknown territory to the dairy industry, which basically is a US, New Zealand, European, good old, 100 year old uh, way of thinking. Products and yogurts and things like that. Try and sell Ribohus in China with the chopsticks. It doesn't work. I've tried it. <laughs> so it's new products that are needed. Will we find these products? We don't know. But we have to give it a, a serious try. And it's going to be difficult because all of these emerging markets, they have different habits. Now in Africa, they eat this and they, they know cheese, by the way, because of the old colony, uh, France and, uh, and the European colony, uh, colony time, they know how to eat cheese. In China, they don't know cheese. They really don't know cheese, but there will be cheese in China. It's just a matter about who finds out, <laughs> who finds out what kind of cheese. And not only different product and, uh, and consumption habits, but the values behind that, the way they view products is driven by different values as a consumer. You have to find out what are these values and how do you approach them from a branding point of view. 
Which leads me to this issue that you have asked me to talk about, and this is going to be as long as what you have just heard, but not longer. We are at the moment changing a lot of things, as I said, in Ala Foods. We are coming from maybe a hundred different brands and sub-brands. When we have acquired company, you inherit a lot of brands, nice brand brands in that, company, in, in that country or in that uh, region, but has nothing to do with uh, the neighboring country that we are also doing business in. And that has become quite of an expensive maneuver, actually, to run all of these brands. We spend more than two billion Danish kroner a year in marketing, just advertising throughout the world. And, and we need to leverage some, get some scale around our, our marketing and our, and our product portfolio carefully, of course, because not every, as I just showed you, not everybody wants the same uh, products. But we have taken a decision that we will, and we are in that process, work with three brands going forward. Lurpak, fantastic product, 100 countries. Castello, fantastic product, 80 countries. Ala, 30 billion franchise. We have a turnover of 30 billion in the Ala brand all over the world, I would guess. But with the Ala brand as a mother brand, the real brand with a lot of value, actually advertising and marketing Ala as a brand. And some of you will say, can you do that with, uh, it's the company? Yes, we can. That's the ambition, but it's also the risky part of our journey. And where do we start our thinking? Well, the thinking started two years ago, and we spent a year developing our thinking. And now we're rolling it out throughout 2014 and probably the next three, four, five years. It starts with our mission and vision. It starts with the thinking that we are owned by farmers. We are there for the farmers. That's our mission. And we re want to be part of that part of the dairy industry that also creates the future, market-wise and consumption-wise. But we are actually using very much our cooperative heritage and fuel our brands with the cooperative heritage. And some would say, oh, that must be dull. H listening, Ala, it's by Ala because it's owned by, by farmers. It's more sophisticated than that, I can tell you. And in Denmark, it doesn't work. It works fantastic in China. They get belief and trust, Danish company owned by farmers, they master the value chain from cow to consumer, all security aspects throughout that value, value chain, we trust that brand. Fantastic, tick. Middle East, exactly the same. Africa, exactly the same. It's only here in Denmark, we're a bit <laughs> odd against other foods, but we're working on that, as you know. It even works in the UK, where we started this campaign a few weeks ago. What we are doing in Arla Foods at the, at the moment is that we are combining a unique history, a culture which is unique being a cooperative, the ability, we are, we, not, not so many are actually capable of controlling the full value chain of the raw milk to the consumer, from cow to consumer. That's unique even in our industry and that's our value proposition. We're combining that with our brand portfolio that we are cleaning up now and we will gradually, over the next two years, see that we, are imp that we are using it into our advertising campaigns. In a different way, of course, because we are not mindlessly global. We are what you would call gl global. So, so we are blending this global approach with a very local execution of how we do it. But the inner DNA is our good growth identity, we call it. I could speak for two hours on that, and I don't have that time. But that drives, this little flower in the, in, in the middle, drives our advertising, our brand portfolio. It drives what we call clear operational evidence. So throughout the value chain, are we, we are working with uh, quality programs that are unique towards farmers. If you want to be a member in Ala Foods, no matter what country, then you have to live up to certain uh, standards. It could be ethical standards, animal welfare standards, quality standards that are unique to Ala Foods. And that uniqueness is then uh, put into our brands and the way we communicate uh, going forward without having farmers all over the place, as you will see in a second. We call this good growth, it's our identity, and not speaking two hours about this, just saying to you, high level, we're combining the company uh, identity together with the brand identity. So we're commercializing actually the value chain the, of, of other foods and bringing it uh, to life in front of the consumers. And it seems to work at the moment. Just as one example, this natural growth, behind that is, is a stand that we took some years ago where we said we don't want any artificials in our dairy products. 
You can make fantastic yogurts with artificials, you know, get your mouth feel and it tastes like wine, you know, anything you would like. So it also limits us. But we have no artificials, we have a very strict GMO policy, etc. Because we are driven and obsessed by making sure that our products are as natural as possible. Uh, and I could uh, continue around that, uh, that flower, I'll not, I'll not do that. It of course creates limitations in our brand portfolio, but it also sharpens our brand portfolio, and our customers know about this. So where are we now? In 2014, we invited 450 marketeers uh, in Arle Foods to a three-day uh, session in Copenhagen uh, from all over the, the world, Russia, uh, China, uh, Denmark, wherever we have marketeers, 400 to 450 altogether, uh, real life market marketeers, work with them with the purpose that they should understand our identity, understand the new strategy. And not only that, but also become believers. That took more than three days, actually. <laughs> but most of them are believers today, and those who after one year are not believers will not have a chance of a long, strong career in Isle Foods, because we mean this really strongly. They're not kicked out, but they're left a little bit alone. <laughs> and then we work with them to understand the need of collaboration. Because we've come from a situation where 450 marketeers in different markets had their own brands, their own agenda, and a very, very local approach. We need to collaborate some more, and we are in that process. That's actually the big change part of our, of, of our strategy, and it looks promising at the moment. And then on the final day, they started to create some ideas, and that was great fun. So where are we now? Let's have a click, and I'll show you two minutes of video. At Arla. We've now started on a new journey. A journey to bring us closer to our consumers, for them to make room for us, not only in their homes, but also in their hearts. In order to maintain sustainable growth and strengthen our position in all our markets, we must ensure a special place in the minds of the consumers. Natural goodness is our promise to consumers and our new communication concept has been developed to build and tighten our relationship with our consumers and to increase loyalty for our Arla brand. To do so, we're removing the complexity of all our brands towards a more simplified brand structure with core products, concepts and endorsed brands. At Arla, we deliver healthy, great-tasting dairy products that are based on natural goodness Products that are simple, natural, wholesome, and nutritious. And we believe that goodness matters, that it satisfies something deeper, feeding our body and soul, that it is a vital thread running through our everyday life. Let in the goodness is our new and powerful payoff. It's there to encourage consumers to enjoy more goodness every single day. It signals enjoyment, health, and naturalness, and on the emotional level, it positions Arla as genuine and caring. In our journey, we are now establishing Let In The Goodness in all our markets to link Arla to good, healthy, natural products that nourishes body and soul. Products that are a natural part of the small, good moments in everyday life. We have created a brand new visual identity for our products and a master brand communication platform, which will be rolled out across all our markets, where local execution will be adapted to the needs and cultural differences of each and every individual market. That is a powerful statement behind all of this. I don't know if you feel that, but, but uh, let, me, let me explore that with you. It uh, guides our innovation programs completely. Uh, and if we can make it work in a second, you'll see how that will happen. Are you coming up there? Yes, there it is. These are our growth uh, platforms. So when our Skype uh, Innovation Center opens uh, next year, all of the people working there will work with these four programs, no matter where they produce or develop products. Our Chinese uh, innovation center will work with these uh, innovation platforms. It's what we call an e-stage, which is you know, describing needs that are actually generic. 
And we have investigated that through thousands and thousands of uh, interviews with consumers from China to, to, to Copenhagen. And there are clear commonalities, but the products that they want and enjoy are different. But the needs that they, are, that they want fulfills are the same. So that will guide, guide our innovation. And as you saw, we have relaunched the Arla brand, 30 mil billion Danish kroner turnover. And not only in Denmark, we're not quite finished there, but it will be, but all over the world. You'll see that in China in a second, that are, we have changed the face to the consumer as well. And then you will see, and that's very new, you will see that we below, and it doesn't work in here, gentlemen in there, uh, you will see that the global concepts uh, that, uh, that we will develop below the Arla brand, it could be, as an example, uh, good to go, as you see it in Denmark today. It could be a breakfast position, good start, as you see here. These uh, are Swedish, uh, uh, Swedish proposition. The products will be different. And of course, the, if you uh, have a good start or a sub-brand or, or good to go positioning under the Arla brand in China, the products running in that co concept will be different but we are unifying uh, what we want to do with consumers because we think that there are some commonalities. And let me give you an example of why it is important not to become mindlessly global. Just look at, look at the value of health. It's a world trend. Everybody talks about health. But if you actually dig into the various regions, the interpretation of health is very, very different. In the European uh, markets, it's about less sugar, less fat, more protein, less salt. In Africa, it's about affordability and uh, getting actually more fat, more sugar, more calories. And in China, it's about do I trust the product, do I die from the product? And we need to interpret that, take that health platform that we're working with in, a, in different ways. And then I'll end up by just saying, this is, those of you in the back can't see it. And you would probably say, could that be in that supermarket in Fertex, a setup there that he's showing? Yes, it could be, but it's actually in China, Beijing, last week. And if you get closer into it, you can see that we are talking about Hans Christian Andersen and fairy tales, that we are talking about trust, that we are talking about, about long Danish history, that we're talking about Danish farmers. Completely different message, but basically the same concept that we are driving. And we're rolling that out over the next, next couple of years all over the world. Two billion marketing program every year. Bloody risky, extremely exciting. And the brightest of you are welcome to participate. <laughs> Thank you. I will uh, try to moderate the discussion and to all of you I will encourage you to ask questions to the pigeonhole and vote for them and I will try to pick up the questions with the, with the most uh, votes. Um, Peter, the, the, most, uh, the question which got most votes, yes. I will ask you, uh, how do you act on challenges from example scientific reports that questions the health benefits of your raw, main raw material, milk? There's only one way of doing that, that's uh, approaching uh, these scientific reports, and they do occur with science. Otherwise, we can't speak together. Luckily enough, um, the science community has changed its view on dairy and, and the fat the dairy produces. So you will actually see that the bulk of, of the understanding of, 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 of dairy is getting into a much more positive momentum. If you go back 10 years ago, it was very negative. But that is changing on a world scale. And then two weeks ago came a funny, uh, completely misunderstood uh, Swedish report that said that you could die or you, 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 you risked uh, dying, or the risk of death increased 15% per glass milk. Only, uh, I think, Excelbred uh, thought that was uh, to meant be uh, taken serious, and it died in one day. That report is long gone. But you said in your presentation that <coughs> Arla is an inside-out company. Yes. Because of your owners. Uh, I guess that means that basically you only have one raw material, the mm -hmm. milk. Does that make you vulnerable? You only have one raw material, and if you have got problems, you are out of business. If, if, if that raw material was doomed to be a raw material that this world doesn't want, then we would be in trouble. But we all start right after the first breath that we take by drinking <coughs> milk from our mummies. I'm not scared. 
so you're not feeling no vulnerable. <laughs> okay. Um, how has the crisis in Ukraine and Russia's relationship to Europe affected Ala? Uh, very brutal. Uh, our business grew uh, seven, uh, between 35 and 70 percent the last three years in Russia. We had bought a company over there uh, that uh, we are in all the cities. We, the Arla is known. It's, everybody knows Arla Foods. Uh, the empties are shelf, uh, are, are, the shelves are empty at the moment. We sell nothing. So uh, we have uh, come from uh, 1.1 billion in turnover to Russia to zero in one day. That's where we are now. And then we'll take it from there on. We've bought a local company producing cheese in Russia uh, to maintain the brand profile. We don't make a lot of money out of it, but just to keep our brand, which is valuable, alive in the Russian uh, market. And that's what we're working with now. And as I understand it, Putin said that it, this would take 12 months, and he normally does what he says. So we are ready to open up 12 months from now uh, because it, we're not only the, ones, on, the only ones hurt, it's more than 3 billion liters of milk, 300,000 tons of, that's a lot of cheese. That's seven, eight times the, the, the amount of cheese consumed in Denmark that has been blocked from the Russian markets. And if you look into the supermarkets in Russia, the, the, empty, the, the, the shelves do le look empty. It, it, must, uh, some, it looks as if it won't last forever. But I understand it lasts 12 months. That's what Putin said. It costs a lot of money, but that's how it is. How do you keep your brand alive while you are out of the Russian market? Well, as I said, we, we have a, a local company producing uh, some volumes, uh, and we are trying to up that volume, finding milk. Uh, we've had a success with that. The entire South American uh, hemisphere has not been, for many reasons, closed by, uh, by Putin, and we have partners and dairy, one dairy in, uh, in, uh, in South America in uh, Brazil, and we are using that, they're all uh, delighted by that, the people there, to actually start to export back into Russia. That was not the reason why we bought that franchise and had that JV from the beginning, <laughs> but uh, it comes handy in now. So I think that we are selling at the moment 30% of what we sold, uh, and that's pretty good actually. So you know we're keeping the brand alive. If you violate the embargo, you can go to prison. Yeah, but we are not violating it. We are very okay. careful and, okay. and talk to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, do you see politicians about this. In this situation, do you see your competitors take advantage of the situation? No. No, because it, Russia has very little ability to service itself in dairy uh, and in many other food areas. So, so everybody are blocked and it hurts everybody. Okay. We have one question there down there. Please stand up and mm -hmm. present yourself. My name is Christopher, and I have a question for Tubo about um, the standard of products. You talk a lot about uh, emerging markets and different standards. How do you ensure that you keep your promise of a Scandinavian a la quality product in emerging markets as China? So they do not only survive eating your products, but also have the pleasure of Scandinavian quality. Now we call it Northern European, to be honest. Well, it starts where we actually have the cows, it starts where we have the production, and it puts a limit actually at the moment, because we could actually produce uh, products uh, to China out of our US facility, for example, in Wisconsin, it, we, we could do that, but that would be compromising the uh, brand value that we have put into the Chi Chinese franchise. So we are not doing that. So we are, our brand marketeers are very careful to live up to that position that we have uh, created. It gives limitations, but it also sharpens the profile. And, and, and I'm a believer in a very sharp profile. I hope that was an answer. Given that most people outside Northern Europe are lactose intolerant, how will you target, ex for example, the emerging markets in yes. Asia? And isn't that a wonderful thing? I also thought that Chinese were lactose intolerant. But that's some, uh, some, somebody got that wrong many years ago in uh, the Danish Science Society or whoever it was. They are not. <laughs> End of story. Sure. <laughs> we are busy here. Um, not more than the rest of us, by the way. Peter, you have many Nordic leaders in your organization. How do you build a global mindset in your organization? That's a very tricky, uh, tricky thing, actually. Uh, the only thing that really works 
is to move people around, to make sure that people from our Nordic markets, from our Danish market, where we have most of our, or quite a bit of our employees, get the chance to get out there. I've been myself in Saudi Arabia and Middle East for many years, in Germany. Uh, so more and more of those, who, or those who want to make, to be honest, a career in other foods, and to want, want to be leaders in this process, need to understand that they have to go out there and blend with uh, different nationalities and work, live with their families for some years. Otherwise, you just won't make it leadership-wise or leader-wise. But we have the great opportunity to have many Chinese sitting here in, 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 in China who also have an aspiration. So we speak uh, all kinds of languages uh, now that we didn't do some years ago because we believe that the only way of actually answering your question is to make sure that we in real right life get some diversity into any organization uh, or, or that we have here or in the various different markets. You said in your presentation, we are there for the farmers. Are you really helping the locals in Africa or just milking them? I think that it's necessary. We haven't cracked that nut uh, completely, but, but in order, we, we must earn the right to be uh, in uh, an area like uh, Africa, and which means that we have to involve ourselves in things that are not just purely business driven. And we are in the process of figuring it out in some of these markets whether we should enter into school programs where you don't really sell products but we're actually uh, helping uh, education of, of children or should we actually go into what we're best at, uh, helping local farmers to become more efficient because they are not. Is that because you as an international company you need to have accept from the community? We need to have accept exactly from communities, not only the local communities, but also the communities of Europe in Denmark. We are scrutinized, of course, by, by all kinds, from, from all, all angles. And we have to have so much transparency and have the guts to, to have some transparency that, we, that we, we show to the world what we are doing. And I can tell you that's probably one of the real difficult things about these emerging markets, that you have to do things that are not necessarily here and now delivering to your uh, profit and loss and, and helping your balance sheet too much, it, uh, but it's delivering, it's giving you the right actually to be in that market, to make money in that market. And that's something that is new to us and, and to the rest of the world actually. You need a license to operate. Again? A license to operate. A license to operate, you can say that. Okay, we are running out of time, Peter, and I would like to ask the last question. Uh, I'm sure that many people here would like to hear your answer on that. If you are a student who wants to have a career like yourself, what is the key advice you would give? <laughs> a big secret is that a lot of my career has, be made, uh, has been made by coincidence. They, everybody says that. So uh, be prepared for coincidence. Because you can't, if you are obsessed by planning your career, you will definitely fail. Especially in my place, when I meet people who are obsessed by that, I just, you know, I don't like that feeling. So, but stick to make, make sure that you're good at what you do, and that you enjoy, it sounds funny, but I actually really mean it, that you enjoy what you are do, doing, that you're happy along the way, and make results today. And don't spend too much time about thinking about where do I want to be 10 years from now? But you have to think, of course, about in the broader sense, where do I want to be good? And that was what I was trying to tell you. Maybe it's not the smartest thing to become a marketing expert in how people in Aarhus want to consume products. Maybe you should have an approach which is more targeted to some of these emerging markets, which will, the day that you will uh, apply to hopefully to become the CEO of Vale Foods, if we exist at that time, 20 th years from now, then you better be knowledgeable in Asia, you better have been out there, and you better be knowledgeable somehow in Africa, and if you're really good, then you've also been there. Then you have a chance. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. The time is running out. Thank you very much.